Well, greetings, good evening, happy Thursday. Um, we're in a car park, which is curious. Um, we have a big screen behind us, which is also curious, but if you didn't know, we're here for an M Pavilion talk. My name is Alex, and I'm here with Julian Burnside. Um, I guess before the talk begins, I'll do some kind of introduction for the both of us. Um, my name's Alex, as I said. I'm a 24-year-old philosopher, if I'm allowed to call myself that. It's hardly, hardly a job. Um, and I am a child of migrant parents. My mum is Macedonian and my dad is Algerian, and that plays a big role in my thinking um, and my, my work. Um, my podcast is called Alex Listens. I actually had the fortune of interviewing Julian on the podcast uh, back in 2018, um, when he told me that he was certain he would never touch politics. 2019 was a very different story, um, but that's enough about me. Um, so, as I said, I'm here with Julian Burnside, um, an eminent Victorian barrister and Queen's Counsel, an author, a patron of the arts, a passionate advocate for human rights and asylum seekers. Julian is known for his staunch and unwavering opposition to the mandatory detention of asylum seekers. He is also involved in a number of important legal cases, including the Octeti Peoples against BHP, and he represented Liberty Victoria in litigation over the Tampa episode, um, just to name two cases. Um, now, Julian has also received an infinite number of awards. Um, I've received no awards, but that's okay. Um, one of the awards he received sounds like something that a precious gem would be given. In 2004, Julian, believe it or not, was elected a living national treasure, which is amazing. Uh, until I die. <laughs> really, is there an expiry date? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, in 2009, he was made an Officer of the Order of Australia, and in 2014, he was awarded a Sydney Peace Prize, where I believe, rumour has it, he received a congratulatory letter from one Noam Chomsky. Is that correct? Wow. So, join me in welcoming Julian Burnside. Um, so I thought the best place would I thought the best place to begin would be um, an attempt to try and trace some kind of narrative um, of the course of your life, which has taken various different twists and turns. You started your career as a commercial lawyer. Um, then later on, you turned to human rights and asylum seeker advocacy and started doing some pro bono work, and then. In 2019, um, you turned to politics. Um, so I guess <laughs> um, we'll start with the law. So what was it about the law that attracted you? Uh, nothing. It was an accident. I, I mean, I, I did better at year 12 than anyone expected, including my family, and um, I didn't know what to do, but I got accepted into... I think four or five different faculties. I had no idea which to accept. Um, there were only two universities in Melbourne at the time. And so I, here I've got to choose between, you know, like engineering at Melbourne and architecture somewhere and this and that. And a former boyfriend of my sister was doing law at Monash. So I thought, well, I'll do law at Monash because then I'll know someone. I never actually saw him. <laughs> so I, d I did did law at Monash without any particular conviction about the law, um, but I knew I wanted an income, so I decided to pick up, pick up an economics degree. So I started economics in my second year of law, and um, I was actually fairly good at economics. I could understand accounts quite easily. And then because because it was voluntary to do mooting, which is like pretend court, I, um, I used to do it a lot. You know, nerds gravitated to it. And, um, and in my second or third last year at university, I think it was, I got invited to be on the Monash InterVarsity mooting team, which that year was in Auckland, New Zealand. I'd never even been to Tasmania. 
So the idea of a free trip to New Zealand was spectacular. So I, I did that, and I, as it happens, I won the Blackstone um, Prize as the best individual speaker. And at the finishing up drinks, prize giving, etc., the Chief Justice of New Zealand, who had presided over the final moot, asked me what I was going to do. I actually wanted to be an artist, but I wasn't prepared to tell him that, so I said, well, I think I'll be a management consultant, which was the reason for doing an economics degree. And he said, hmm, you should go to the bar. Now, it occurred to me a couple of years ago, it'd be funny if what he really meant was go and get another glass of wine. <laughs> My whole life might have been built on a mistake. <laughs> anyway, so that's... that's a, but later that year, actually, it was quite important. Um, in December of that year, for, at Christmas time, another member of the Monash University mooting team gave me the Irving and Stone biography of Clarence Darrow for Christmas. And that really was a revelation. I think it was written in 1940 or so. Clarence Darrow was one of those remarkable... American advocates who um, he was he was a person who pursued causes and although it was very unpopular he was against the death penalty and he ran a number of very famous and important death penalty cases but he ran cases to pursue the causes that concerned him and it was a revelation um, he was not only a very gifted advocate he was a man of real principle. So I thought, well, if that's what being a barrister is, that sounds pretty good. Right. And it sounds like Cla Clarence Darrow was doing criminal law or something like that. He was, yeah. How come you ended up in... <laughs> good question. On Collins Street? Just another accident. Really? Just another accident, yeah. Um, because I had an economics degree and because I was pretty good with accounts... I started being briefed by the tax office, would you believe? In, Lovely people. In, in asset betterment cases where they all focused ultimately on their accounts. And um, that then led, that was the middle of the 70s. That sort of took me into the early 80s when the takeovers boom started and I started being briefed in takeovers cases and so I found myself doing commercial work. And... One of the people you represented um, is a man named Alan Bond. Um, he's a, uh, he was a very wealthy man um, and he was a very controversial figure. Um, and this got me thinking, I guess the, the move from commercial law to human rights stuff later in your life got me thinking. Um, so I was wondering, what was... Do you have any, any kind of um, prevailing memories of your time in commercial law? What was, it, what was it like representing people like Alan Bond? Was it meaningful? Was Bond it... was actually pretty good company. I, <laughs> I enjoyed knowing him. Um, the, the thing is, at the bar, what most people don't know is that at the bar there is a thing called the cab rank principle, which is that if you're offered a brief and it's marked at an appropriate fee, you must take it doesn't matter whether you hate the client, hate the cause or whatever. You must take it. And I think that's a pretty good principle. Um, so that probably explains why I got to act for Alan Bond. Mind you, I did like him. Right, right. <laughs> OK. Um, and one last question um, about the law before we try and kind of uh, veer elsewhere. Um, in your experience... Has the law been a good mechanism for healing society, for, for constructing a more equal, a more fair, um, a more transparent society where people are held accountable and that kind of stuff? Has, over the course of your whole career, has that, has that been your experience of the Australian legal system? Um, to be candid, I haven't thought about it that way. I do think the Australian legal system works pretty well. It depends on the people at the top, the judges and so on, deciding cases honestly according to their genuine opinions and in my view they do that. I don't agree with them in a lot of cases but I've never doubted their honesty and I think that's really important. Um, whether it, 
shapes society? I suppose the law does in a way. It either shapes it or reflects it. It's hard to know which. Hmm. Okay. That's enough commercial law for now. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, the next thing... Lucky I... you didn't say that to me in the late 70s. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, for any, for any budding young lawyers here... There are actually many in the audience. Okay, so well, my friends, thank you for let me say, Let me say, I think you may be inspired by human rights the way I was when I read the book about Darrow. Um, but a human rights lawyer with no assets and no income is almost worthless. You know, if you've got your seat out of your pants, you're not going to be very good in court. So I would, I've advised lots of young uh, law students to get the very best articles they can at the very best firm they can find and keep working there. I mean, the big firms, their money is just as good as anyone else's and they've, they're usually very skillful. So I would say, um, yeah, Some before you start doing pro advice. bono human rights work. <laughs> right, well, on that note, um, in, the, in the 90s, there was a, I guess, a, another big shift in your career. Um, so we've moved from Julian as a young a young lawyer who did some management consulting, who went into the corporate world, represented lovely people like Alan Bond. And then in the 90s, something changed and you started to do pro bono work. Um, that, that's only partly right. There was another case in the middle. In 1998, I acted for the Maritime Union of Australia in the waterfront dispute. And that was interesting in a couple of ways. First, because... I got a call, uh, I was in chambers one day, I got a call and it was a solicitor saying, look, you know, wondering if you want a brief in this, um, in this waterfront case. And I said, well, when's it going to happen? And he said, oh, you know, sort of March, April-ish. So I said, I won't be able to do it. When I got home and spoke to Kate, I said to her, what a good bloke I am, you know. I said no to a brief, even because it was going to clash with our honeymoon. And she said, well, tell me more about it. And I said, oh, something to do with waterfront dispute. And she said, oh, that's going to be a great case. You should have said yes, ring them back. I said, what? <laughs> I can't do that. So anyway, I'm in chambers the next day feeling a bit crestfallen. And um, I got a call, someone wondering if I can accept a brief in the waterfront case. And I said, as a matter of fact, I can. Well, the first day it was the farmers. The second day it was the union. So... <laughs> Wow. It was by you that may have changed minor the course chance, of history. By that tiny wow. chance, yeah. Wow. And, and what was it that marked the shift? What drew you towards pro bono work? What, what marked that change in your career? Um, was, it, was it, as you were saying, did you reach the point where there was a safety net, where you had, you know, enough, enough money to, you know, start working for people who won't be going to pay you as much. Yeah, look, I, I think it happened a little more slowly than that. Um, the MUA case made a big difference. It made a big difference to my practising life because at one point during the MUA case, it was fairly commonly known that I was getting death threats. It's the only case, I think, where I've had death threats. And no one, none of the commercial lawyers on the floor that I was on then bothered to come round and see if I was okay. And I thought that was pretty crook. So when I got the chance, I moved chambers to somewhere else and that was a floor that did quite a lot of human rights type work. So that was the reason for that shift, I think. But then in August um, of 2001, um, actually between the MUA and August of 2001 when I was asked to act on behalf of the refugees on the deck of the Tampa. Um, that was the big shift. That was the big shift. And that happened because, I mean, uh, there are these poor people. Australian, the Australian government had contacted the captain of the Tampa, which is a Norwegian cargo ship, and said, look, a little boat with Afghan Hazara refugees has fallen apart in the Indian Ocean. Can you help them? Because the Tampa was going from west to east across the top of Australia. And um, 
And the captain of the Tampa saw the little palapa, which was the boat the refugees had been on, and formed the view that it might have had maybe 50 people on board. He threw a rope ladder over the side and was amazed when 438 people climbed up the ladder onto the deck of the ship. Now, he had a problem, two problems actually. One, the ship was licensed to carry 50 people. He had 47 crew and 438 unexpected passengers. And second, perhaps more importantly, some of the people were in fairly difficult state of health. Uh, you know, there were pregnant women, there were a couple of older people and so on. Anyway, so he had to, he had to cruise past Christmas Island. He decided to try and put them ashore on Christmas Island and he went, he was told by the Australian government, you're forbidden to enter Australian waters off the coast of Christmas Island and... He ignored that and did it anyway. And the Australian government sent out the SAS who took command of the bridge at gunpoint. Okay? And then for days, these poor buggers sat on the steel decks of the Tampa in the tropical sun because they weren't going anywhere. And uh, I was asked if I'd do the case for liberty and I said yes. Not because I knew anything about treatment of refugees because I knew nothing but because I've always felt the heat. And I thought, that must be so uncomfortable being out there on the steel decks of a ship in the tropical sun. And um, the ju judge, we actually won a trial. Everyone overlooks that because the appeal happened very quickly and we got knocked off 2-1 on the appeal. But the judgment of the trial judge was handed down in Melbourne at 2.15 in the afternoon Melbourne time on the 11th of September 2001 and 10 hours later the attack on America happened and all of a sudden John Howard started calling boat people uh, illegal because uh, since all of the people who attacked America on the 11th of September 2001 were Muslim, all those terrorists were Muslim, therefore all, ter all Muslims were terrorists, all boat people were supposedly Muslim, although they weren't. Therefore, they're all terrorists, so we call them illegal. And that is still to this day, I think, the most damaging observation about boat people. It's done more harm than anyone could have imagined back then. Right. And one thing that you've touched on is um, something that comes up a lot in uh, the philosophy of language, um, and that is the the manipulation of language with the objective of changing how people relate to and understand the world. Hey, I'm embarrassed, I understand. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you do. Um, and there, there have been a number of things that the Australian government has done, a number of tweaks to language. Um, for example, our current Prime Minister, um, when he was the Minister for Immigration, um, he changed the title of one of the departments from the Department of uh, Immigration and Citizenship to the Department of Immigration and Border Security. Um, and, you know, these things have profound effects on the way that we understand the world, we understand the other. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the power and the limits of language as a mechanism for... Uh, for both politicians to manipulate public sentiment, but also for, you know, us people who would like to change the way Australians think about asylum seekers, how we can um, reconstruct language uh, for the better. That's such a difficult question. <laughs> I, I did mention in passing on the way to talk about Tampa, another case that I think is a very important case that happened in the middle. Oh, no, maybe it happened afterwards. Yeah, may have, been, may have been after Tampa. Um, the case that happened after Tampa was the case of Bruce Trevorrow. Um, Bruce was born in November 1956 to an Aboriginal family. Um, he and his family lived at One Mile Camp, Meningi. Now, Meningi is on the Coorong in South Australia. It's a fly speck of a town even now. And in 1956, it must have been minuscule. Anyway, One Mile Camp was a collection of humpies uh, made out of flattened out oil drums and so on. Um, 
because back in November 1956, it was illegal for Aboriginal people to live closer than one mile to a place of white settlement unless they had a, v, unless they had a permit. Okay, so I, I, Bruce, when he was 48, I think, or 47, um, was wandering through the main streets of Adelaide and went to the Aboriginal legal rights movement and they set up a case for him, um, basically attacking the government for having taken him from his parents. He was, <clears throat> he was taken from his parents in very odd circumstances. It was um, when he was 13 months old, it was Christmas Day of 1957, and he got very ill. Uh, some people in Meningi who had a car drove him to the Adelaide Children's Hospital and he was, the hospital records still survive. He was diagnosed as having gastroenteritis. There was a wave of it going through South Australia at the time. He was treated appropriately and one week later he was better and a week after that he was given away to a white family who lived in suburban Adelaide. Now, for the next eight years, the government of South Australia pre actively prevented his mother from finding out where he was or making any contact with him. And Bruce grew up seriously damaged and unfortunately the damage that he suffered I think will be passed on to his children because he was a hopeless father and a terrible husband. Um, anyway, so they had Robin Layton who was an Adelaide silk she got appointed to the Supreme Court. They got Sid Tilmouth, who was an Adelaide silk, and he got appointed to the district court. And so they hunted around and they asked me if I'd take it on. I said yes. And that was a, a really, really good case. It was interesting because we won the case. Bruce is and remains the only Aboriginal person uh, to have been taken from his parents as a child uh, to be awarded damages by a superior court. He's the only true member of the Stolen Generation, the only member of the Stolen Generation found as such by a Supreme Court. Now, we didn't get judgment in Bruce's case until August 2007. And having waited quite a while for the judgment, I was concerned the judge was going to stitch us up. Um, anyway, judgment in our favour on every point. And um, later that year, of course, um, Rudd became Prime Minister and he said that the first business of the new parliament was going to be an apology to the stolen generations. Well, Bruce had two brothers, Tom and George Trevorrow, who were both um, pretty, pretty, you know, they were, leading, they were leading lights in the Aboriginal community and they had never been removed from their family because the department recorded the family as being a very good family. And so they got invited, but Bruce didn't get invited. We sent a note to the officers involved and said, what about Bruce? He's actually the only true member of the Stolen Generation. And so he quickly got an invitation and he got there and he managed to be in the public gallery for the apology to the Stolen Generations, but he died in June of that year, 2008, um, just short of his 52nd birthday. That's what we've done to Aboriginal people in this country. And it's, I've got to say, doing that case was a huge wake-up call for me to realise how badly Aboriginal people have been treated in this country. I had never, you know, I, I was sort of aware of the fact that um, <clears throat> we had always treated Aboriginal people as not owning the land, uh, you know, terra nullius, all of that. And that's true enough, but what I learnt during Bruce's case was that Aboriginal people, their connection to the land is like that between child and parent. Now, most kids would not claim to own their parents, even though their behaviour might suggest different. Um, so... We, we caused them immense harm by taking the land from them and then we redoubled the harm by taking the children from the parents. And we look at them as no-hopers and wonder why. We never actually pause to ask whether maybe we're part of the problem. And we should. We really should. 
Uh, I mean, not everyone's perfect, not all Aboriginal people are perfect, but we really should not expect Aboriginal people to live up to our standards on our terms in order to treat them properly. All right. And in 2019, when you ran for political office, was, was this something that you hoped or planned to address? And if so, how? Um, if ever I get into parliament and can tolerate being in amongst a bunch of politicians, um, I would hope to be able to discuss with them issues that matter and to have some influence on them. I mean, I think talking about these things, explaining the facts, explaining the fact of Bruce's case to you seems to have made a difference. Uh, explaining the facts about climate change, which strikes me as being the number one issue on the planet these days. I mean, I think it was extraordinary. We saw it in, in most countries apart from the United States. The really rapid political reaction to COVID-19. I mean, in Australia, we handle it pretty well. In Australia, politically, although there's cause for some concerns about some of the politicians, uh, the fact is that COVID-19, which threatens the lives of 1% of the population, um, the reaction to it was very, very sharp and very fast. Well, what about climate change? Climate change threatens the lives of 100% of the population, and it's, it's hard to find a politician who actually acknowledges the truth of it. Why? Because they'll be, they'll be out of politics and dead by the time it happens. And that's, that is a, I guess, I believe that the way the world reacts and the way many people react to the issue of climate change is driven by uh, a kind of knowledge-based poverty of the experience of climate change. Um, how, how do you believe Australia, um, how do you believe Australian government, um, how do you believe the Australian people can change the way we think about big issues like climate change such that we can have a response that, you know, such that we can mobilise so many resources the way we did with something like the pandemic? I think we need to persuade the world at large that climate change is dangerous and we should take steps to prevent it from cutting in in the way it looks like it will. Now, but I think that means stop taking lumps of coal into the parliament unless you leave them there. Stop talking about coal mining as an enterprise for the next 20 or 30 years, which is what Morrison did the other day. You know, take actual steps to slow down climate change. Even if that means that some industries are going to have to adjust, well, so what? One thing that's going to have to happen in order for the coal industry to be put on the back burner is that we will need to elect reasonable politicians. Um, and one question that comes to mind is a question of the legitimacy of the institution of democracy um, and whether it is something, whether democratically elected governments, um, whether that is a, the best way to make things happen because climate change, as you've acknowledged, is a ticking time bomb. Um, we don't really have the time to wait for these things. We don't have the time to wait for, you know, old conservatives to drift off into the sunset. Um, so, how, how can, what, how do you feel about democracy? Do you, do you trust the Australian people to elect? Because I guess we haven't had a fantastic history of electing politicians who care about these things. Democracy as a principle is very good. And as Churchill said, I think, better than all the others. <laughs> um, but the way it's implemented here and in America and probably in Britain as well is way below standard. Um, 
I mean, I, I have so little regard for the politicians of major parties in this country. You may have picked up on that. Um, and what about in America? I mean, what about people like Ted Cruz, the way he's flipped his attitude? What about oh, Lindsey Graham? Jesus. Um, now, no system, whatever you call it, is going to be much good if the people who operate it are hopeless losers like them. Fair enough. Um, but still, I think there's one question that I'm, I'm going to pursue you on this because I want an answer. Um, how, so you've had, essentially your career has been based on one particular relation and that is a relationship between you as a barrister and a judge as someone who makes a decision. And your duty there is to convince and to provide evidence and to sway someone or to reveal, you know, the truth in scare quotes about a particular situation. Do you have any particular insight into the way that people here can continue, can, they can leave here and they can talk to people around them in a way that will change the way people think? How can we actually make a difference? Um, I think knowing the facts and persuading other people about those facts is very important. Um, it's astounding to see the sort of idiocy that some politicians get away with. They talk dishonestly all the time or most of the time and that's going to destroy almost any system. Um, so I think the first thing to do is to make sure that you know what you're talking about and persuade other people about it. I mean, I'm fascinated by the number of people I've met who are totally against the idea of refugees. Uh, well, since late 2001, Kate and I have had refugees living at home with us and we've met millions of refugees. Um, and my assessment over a long time is that refugees are just like the rest of us. You know, there's a tiny percentage who are dazzlingly brilliant. There's a tiny percentage who you wouldn't want to meet again. And the vast bulk in the middle are terrific, ordinary people with some flaws, sure, but just they're, they're just ordinary people like us. And it's amazing how many people we've met who suddenly realise, oh, yeah, God, these people are just like us. What's wrong with them? Don't see the point. You've, you've really, you really need to make sure that you're, the audience you're trying to persuade understands the facts in a way that's genuine. And meeting refugees is probably the most compelling way to understand the facts about refugees. Yeah, and I was just going to say, it sounds like uh, a lot of what you're saying is drawing on the idea that experience, the experience of something is a very compelling way to, to convince someone of something. Um, but the issue we have in Australia with our rigid borders is that the opportunity to meet an asylum seeker um, isn't probably something that too many people have experienced um, unless they are Julian Burnside. Um, yeah. Well, if that's right, what are they worrying about? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing to think that the Australian public went along with the idea of using Manus Island and Nauru as places to dump refugees we didn't want. Has anyone here been to Nauru? I have. I've been there a couple of times. Yeah, OK. You would be aware of the fact that Nauru is smaller in land area than Tullamarine Airport. So what are we worried about? Are we really seriously... Do we seriously think that Nauru can fit the people that we can't fit? And... Look at all the people in Australia and consider how many of them, like you, have got backgrounds from other countries. Um, it's, it's been the strength of Australia that we have come from lots of other countries and um, one, of the, one of the very best orthopaedic surgeons in this country came to Australia as a boat person. So, now, not, not every boat person is going to have the talents of Munjad al Madiris, but um, if they're just like us, if most of them are just like us, where's the problem? Right. I think if democracy was going to work, 
the politicians who are against the idea of us accepting refugees should explain to us in detailed terms why, what's wrong with refugees. Mm. And I don't think, apart from, you know, kind of feigned attempts at saying, oh, they're going to take your jobs, oh, they're going to yeah, do yeah. this wrong yeah, yeah, to yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. We need them right now, don't we, for yeah. fruit picking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I, I'm actually on um, Job Seeker at the moment and I'm being hounded <laughs> with with all of these various fruit picking jobs around the country. Um, anyway, um, when we spoke in 2018, you had, uh, you presented a very interesting um, idea about how Australia could receive asylum seekers. Um, it was something like um, not coastal capitals, They'll be put in regional towns for a brief period. I was wondering whether you could share with us that kind of... Um, yeah. I, so I, can I open your drink bottle for you? Yeah, if you can. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, the, the idea was that people who come here seeking asylum should be... Thank you, thank you, well done. Instead of being put in um, detention centres for years on end, they should perhaps be put in uh, country towns where the people are much more open, much more honest about their assessment of other human beings and much more honest in their response to other human beings. Um, I worked out that even if the scaremongering politicians were even vaguely accurate in their assessment of how many refugees would come to Australia, if, if only one country town in ten was willing to take uh, refugees as they came, their population would increase by, at most, about 2%. So, where's the problem? You know, we, most Australians haven't got the faintest idea what refugees have come from and why it is that they take the risk of getting on a boat and a people smuggler and getting to Australia the way they do. And a story which I think I mentioned to you last time. Um, this was a, a family from Iran, mum and dad and two daughters. And the daughters at the relevant time were 11 and 7, as I recall. Anyway, the, um, this family fled Iran in desperate circumstances in, at 2am one morning. And they managed, to, they headed south, which was their first big mistake. Um, so they got down through to Indonesia. In Indonesia, they managed to find a people smuggler who put them on a boat and took, brought them towards Australia and were put in Woomera Detention Centre in the South Australian desert. And Woomera, as you know, is no longer a detention centre, but it used to be. And... Um, the the eleven year old girl had totally given up. She had stopped eating. She'd stopped caring for herself. She'd stopped grooming herself. And her story reached a psychiatrist who was either in Sydney or Adelaide. I can't remember which. And he went to Woomera and delivered a devastating report about this kid. He said she needed daily psychiatric help. And back then in Woomera, if you needed psychiatric help, if you were lucky, you would get to see the visiting psychiatrist once every six or seven months. She needed daily psychiatric help. So the department, in its infinite mercy, moved the whole family to Maribyrnong in the western suburbs of Melbourne, and that's where I met them. And although the reason for moving the family was that this kid needed daily psychiatric help, um, for the first few weeks of their time in Maribyrnong, nobody came to see her. Not a psychiatrist, not a doctor, not a nurse, not a social worker, nobody at all. It was as if they hadn't arrived. And on a Sunday night in May of 2002, while her mother and father and her young sister were off in the mess hall having dinner, this little kid alone in their cell took a bed sheet and hanged herself. But she's only little, didn't know how to tie the knot, and so she is still strangling when they got back after dinner. She and her mother were taken to the general hospital nearby. Um, and 
Concarra Panagia Titus from the Asylum Seekers Resource Centre had been looking after their visa application and so he heard about this. He went to the hospital that night. They were taken to the hospital in the company of two ACM guards. So as a matter of legal analysis, they were still in immigration detention. Um, Con arrived at the hospital about half past nine, said good day to the guards who know him pretty well because he's a regular visitor there. Um, he said, I just want to speak to the mother to see if there's anything I can do. And the guard said, no, you can't see them because lawyers visiting ours in immigration detention are nine to five. And they sent him away. He then rang me at home and told me what had happened. And I cannot get over, even now, almost 20 years later, I can't get over the outrage I felt at that, that we could so badly treat a kid that she would try to kill herself and then turn away someone who was actually just offering simple help. Amazing. Anyway, that little girl was assessed as needing to go to the child and, uh, child and adolescent mental health unit at the Austin Hospital in the eastern suburbs. She went there. About 12 months later, she was assessed as substantially better, good enough to go back into detention, so they put her back into detention. How about that? We eventually got refugee visas for them and they they moved up to Sydney to be with a group of their co-religions because they were not Muslim. They belonged to a pre-Christian sect. Um, so much for your, all your stuff about all boat people being Muslims and terrorists. Um, unbelievable. And that's just one example of how badly we treat refugees. But, I mean, can you imagine... Can you imagine fleeing to another country, a country with a totally different language, different culture, different everything, and being treated like that. You would, all of us in this room, I think, would hope to be treated decently if we would if we're in such desperate circumstances that we had to flee. Mm. And I know that um, the piece of paper that you're carrying with you has has something to say about dignity and decency. I believe it's from an Israeli philosopher, Avishai Margalit. Um, what did you... What's on the piece of paper? Well, it was... Avishai Margalit made a comment about Rawls's... Rawls... John Rawls, American philosopher, had a theory about... He wrote a book about the just society. And his theory of a just society was that it was one in which um, the position that people would occupy in that society would be decided collectively, but the person choosing would not know what position they were going to be in, the veil of ignorance. Um, anyway, the idea, his, his thinking was that a just society would avoid unfairness. And in fact, he set it out in terms that I can't memorise. Each person has an equal right to the most extensive scheme of equal basic liberties compatible with similar schemes for all. Fair enough. Social or economic inequalities must satisfy two conditions. A, they must benefit the least advantaged members of the society. So, um, and second, they must be attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of fair and equal opportunity. If you've got a society which is a just society in Rawlsian terms, um, would it also be a decent society? And uh, in other words, it's a society which achieves a, an equal and just distribution of all of society's goods, but will it also be a decent society? And his answer was, in effect, no. He said, for example, imagine a town where there are 100 inhabitants and they all need a kilogram of rice. He says there are two ways of achieving that. One, you could drive in with a truck with 101 kilogram bags of rice and hand out a bag to each person. Alternatively, you could bring the truck in, tip all the rice on the ground and have some armed guards standing around who would punish anyone who tried to take more than their fair share. The second, he said, both would be just, but the second is humiliating. And he said, and this is the passage I think you're referring to, the distribution may be both efficient and just, yet still humiliating. The claim that there can be bad manners in... The, 
The claim that there can be bad manners in a just society may seem petty, confusing the major issue of ethics with the minor one of, eti of etiquette, but it's not petty. It reflects an old fear that justice may lack compassion and might even be an expression of vindictiveness. There's a suspicion that the just society might become mired in rigid calculations of what is just, which may replace gentleness and humane consideration in simple human relations. The requirement that a just society should also be a decent one means that it's not enough for goods to be distributed justly and efficiently, the style of their distribution must also be taken into account. And that strikes me as being exactly right. We want a just society, but also a decent society. And we won't get it with the crappy politicians we've got in charge at the moment. Sorry. <laughs> I don't apologise to me. Um, one, one thing that we haven't spoken too much about yet, but is relevant to... I guess the the forming of a a decent and dignified society is um, good funding of the arts, um, such as this event. This is funded by M Pavilion, um, who I thank kindly for allowing me to talk to Julian. Um, and Julian, you've been a patron of the arts for a very long time. Um, why? What what does the arts represent? Because the for you? arts are really important. I mean, if you, it's very interesting. If you think, everyone's heard of Leonardo da Vinci, everyone's heard of Ludwig van Beethoven, everyone's heard of Leo Tolstoy. Can anyone name a lawyer or an accountant or an economist who worked in the same place at the same times? I've never met anyone who could. Um, if we need, we need people who are artists. Imagine, imagine living your life without ever being able to go to the National Gallery and see the collection they've got there. Imagine going through life without ever hearing anything written by Mozart or Beethoven or Shostakovich. Imagine. Imagine life without the arts. It would be dreadful. I happen to believe that the arts are more important than anything I've ever done or ever will do. Now, I tell my wife this. She's an artist. She makes jewellery and she doesn't agree. <laughs> Well, I'm, I don't have that view in order to get agreement from people. Um, I just happen to think it's very important. Incidentally, when I pulled this out to find what Margaret had said, I found something said by an Australian politician. What about this? I want to talk about the centrality of human rights to our foreign policy objectives and our decision to make effectiveness the guiding principle of our actions. The second reason for our distinctive approach to human rights has more to do with an Australian way of doing things. Our approach is pragmatic, but it's also firmly rooted in an ideological commitment to liberal democratic ideals. I believe this blend of the practical and the idealistic very much reflects the character of Australia. A separate public forum could no doubt be dedicated to discussing what core Australian values are, or even if they exist, uh, in the year 2000. Personally, I have no qualms in saying that one of our ab abiding values is that of a fair go for all. Australians care about human rights because they believe strongly in a fair go. They support the underdog and they take particular exception to abuses of power. They see justice and human dignity as a self-evident right of all people. They also prefer to cut through the rhetoric and do something useful. I wonder if anyone can work out who said those words. It was Alexander Downer. Boy, what a load of crap. <laughs> it's a real shock to think that Alexander Downer could have said those words. I agree with the words, but I don't think he did. Well, we are out of time. Um, so, before applause, Q&A. Um, so, we will now open the stage up to questions. Anyone, anything, any time? Up the back? There's someone up the back. Um, oh. Hi, um, thank you for a fantastic lecture. We've talked a bit about human rights, but one question that I'm fascinated by at the moment is that technology is advancing at a very rapid rate, and yet there's no move internationally to come up with some sort of treaty to prevent robots being used as weapons or soldiers um, so if America or Russia or some 
strange um, uh, state around the world decides to just mobilise a robot population to massacre the humans. Currently, there's no treaty in that space at all. Um, any comments? Um, oh, well, I suppose you could send all the robots to Nauru. <laughs> um, I guess it's ultimately about the attitudes which people have. If robots are going to be used to go out and kill human beings, which I think is your fundamental point, um, then most, most people, if, ex if that's explained to them properly, um, they probably wouldn't go along with it. I, I like to think of these things as the Rawls theory in reverse. If you make sure that the individual understands what these things mean, then the individual is likely to oppose them because, I mean, you say to the individual, imagine yourself in the circumstances where you are going to be torn limb from limb by a robot or you're going to be executed by a robot. Most people would think that's a dreadful idea. Um, I, d I don't know if that deals adequately with your question. Um, just one thing. There's a very interesting book by um, a philosopher. Uh, the book's called Super Intelligence. The author is called Nick Bostrom, and I think you might find some interesting um, things in that book, which might reassure you that um, it seems like we're relatively far away from, uh, you know, intelligent, autonomous warfare. Um, any other questions? Yep. Someone... Uh, thank you for the talk, Julian. It, you guys spoke a bit about the institutions of democracy and how we can kind of shift people's opinions. Um, and I just was wondering if you had anything to say about the influence of the Murdoch media in Australia and how you can shift people's opinions when they're completely inculcated in such a malignant... Yeah, great, great question. Um, there, in any society bigger than Nauru... You, can, you will not get the chance to speak to every individual in that community. And so the way politicians get in touch with the public at large is through the press. The Murdoch press is dominant and, in my view, it's um, less than adequate. Um, I, I think it would be terrific if we had a much more vigorous media... I mean. What do you do? What do you do now? The ABC is pretty good. It gives you a fairly wide range, although they're a bit frightened of government because they depend on government for funding. SBS is pretty good if you can stand the fat chunks of advertisements. Um, the Guardian newspaper is good, but how many people read it? Well, it's about 2% of the public. Um, we, we do need another media giant with a broader view of the world than the Murdoch Press has. Has anyone here seen Succession? Yeah. <laughs> now, it's not explicitly about the Murdoch family, but, boy, it really reminds you of them. And it's interesting that it's put up by Fox. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Julian, thanks very much for your um, uh, talk this evening. I was wondering, I was interested in your response to the fact that um, a number, thankfully, of the refugees who've been locked up in Carlton have now been freed. And I was wondering what the repercussions might be for the others in a similar situation. Can we now see that the government is changing um, and why are they and what's the future, do you feel? They could be changing. I don't know why and I don't know whether you can generalise from it, but it's worth bearing in mind that the people who've been released are people in detention who've been brought under the Medivac legislation from Nauru or Manus Island to Australia. Um, one of them who I'm in touch with uh, was brought here because he needed cardiac help. He's been here for 18 months. 
He was assessed in Manus Island as a refugee, okay? So he's a refugee brought to Australia by us. Uh, he was on Manus for, I think, seven years. He's been in detention here for a year and a half. He has not received the cardiac treatment that he was brought here to get. And, oh, do you think it's a noble thing for politicians to be releasing a guy after eight and a half years in prison, after committing no offence whatever? I don't know. It's, it's wretched. And if every member of the public knew how badly these people have been treated, I suspect that the public at large would object to the government that's doing it. And I don't think the opposition are much better. The Labor Party, after all, reintroduced offshore detention in Rudd's second government. He was good in the first time round but his second time round, he was pretty crook and seemed to uh, fall into step with the Liberal Party. It's not what Australia should be doing. But we are sheep. We just read what the Murdoch paper says. You know, Murdoch calls them illegals and we're happy with that. What do you do with criminals? You lock them up. Sorry, that's the end of it. Any other, any other questions? Yep. Um, do you think the Murdoch, do you think Kevin Rudd's um, proposed Murdoch uh, Royal Commission is uh, going to go through or going to come to anything? Do they have many legal avenues to really make change in the world? Yeah, good question. Short answer is I don't know. Uh, it's all in the land of politics and I just don't know. Um, but I saw Rudd just at the time when he had, I think, 50,000 signatures, and he's now got, what, half a million? Which is very encouraging. It shows that even though we are a nation of sheep, we seem to have quite a fair percentage of people in this country who think enough about issues to notice what the murder press are doing. And we, can, we have to hang on to that. And see if any of your friends regularly read the Murdoch Press. And if they do, just try and fill them in with the rest of the facts. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for coming, everyone. And let's put our hands together to thank Julian Burnside. <laughs>